Well, we were all a bunch of kids, depression type, back in, in the 30s, 40s. And when the war broke out and Pearl Harbor was attacked, we were still paper boys out delivering our papers. We got the news and we were to report to our paper stations. Well, we were shocked, of course. We were still in high school. And we didn't even uh, know where Pearl Harbor was when I, I happened to be in a gym and putting on uh, my tennis shoes when I, and ready for a basketball game when uh, uh, this other young fellow uh, broke through the locker room and said, uh, the Japanese have just bombed Pearl Harbor. By then the draft was going crazy and everybody was eligible for the draft. And I uh, went down and signed up for the Air Force, the Air Corps as it was called in those days. And uh, I was told then that uh, we probably would be called up in maybe March or April of 42. Well, everybody in my home city of Milwaukee all of my friends were already in the service. And so when I was called to go, I was kind of glad because then I wasn't. It was a nice experience, I thought. My mother, uh, she was a single mother because my father had been killed uh, five days before he's 21. He was, uh, before he's 29, I'm sorry. Uh, he was a police officer and he was killed in the line of duty in Lake Geneva. So she was a widow at 27, and um, she did not want me to go in the service, of course, because of what happened to my father, our father. And um, I was 17, and uh, she had a sign for me, which she was very reluctant to do, obviously, for, for those reasons. And I can't blame her for that. And I, but I explained to her that if if she did not sign for me, I would get drafted and I would get some part of the military that I wasn't looking for. I, wa I wanted the medical aspect. As each one went through the processing, they asked them whether they wanted Army or Navy. And the first five said Navy, or Navy yeah, and bang, we're in the Army. So the sixth guy comes along and they said, what do you want, Army or Navy? He said, Army. He ended up in the Navy. <laughs> so, so that was your choice. <laughs> How I became a cook, that was strange. See, I was the engine man on a landing boat, and I was supposed to start the engine up for the uh, ramp as we come in to make the landings. Well, I went over there, and we had it was a Wisconsin engine, and I was going to crank it, and another kid come up and said, hey, let me do that. I said, okay, go ahead. But he grabbed the handle the wrong way and he back, came back and broke both bones right off his hand. <laughs> and the skipper said, why'd you let him do it? I said, he wanted to. And he says, well, he was a cook's helper. You are now the cook's helper. When they came out to parks and recruited the 75 people, that was one of the stipulations. They said that you, you, Autumn, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to go to Navy headquarters and you're going to become a, uh, given a, 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 a status in the Navy. Um, and when you enter into basic training, um, you know, they're going to um, take you from the individual you are um, to being one of the team. And you have to learn that pretty rapidly. Then you learn how to walk. You learn how to shoot a rifle, uh, get trained with several different kinds of weapons, and uh, they just make a soldier out of you. We had to learn navigation, we had to learn communications, we had to learn the operation of the craft and the maintenance of the craft, and so forth. And so it, it took our time. And, uh, and again, as I say, uh, the instructors were, were very knowledgeable and uh, 
very accepting of our answers and our help and and uh, the way we the way we responded to the training. One instructor I had took us up, took me up especially, and put me in a 13-turn spin. And at the end of it, he was yelling for us to get out of it. You know, just use the controls, and you got to do everything by the numbers, and it ends up you end up coming out of the con controlled spin, and you have control back of the airplane. That's one of the most exciting things I've ever been in. I would not do it again. <laughs> I think the most difficult portion of it was the overseas trip from uh, uh, Wisconsin to, uh, actually from Illinois to, uh, to uh, New Guinea. And we spent 29 days on the water and uh, had two meals a day and then we were issued a little less than a half a gallon of fresh water a day. and, and uh, and had real tight quarters. But the sad thing was we left port in the night and when I woke up I saw only water. And I've never forgotten the fact that I never saw my country go. They were desperate for people so uh, during the interview process I was promoted and uh, I couldn't, you know, I didn't know what, what was happening really. I found out later. So, uh, but when I got to Europe for the Normandy invasion, uh, it was on the job training in surgery. Um, so my job during Desert Storm as a military um, fire protection program manager is what we were called, um, was to select units to be deployed um, into the war zone. But every day I'd walk in and I'd ask my boss if I could go. And he was a Vietnam vet as well. And, and he was, no, you don't want to go to war. Um, you're going to stay here and keep doing what you're doing. All the lieutenants were assigned to forward observers. We didn't know what that was. Well, we did because we trained on it. We didn't expect it quite so soon, though. So within a, four days, we were all on the front line. That was a shock. At that time, the war was going for pretty heavy. And and you, you were wondering if you were going to come back or not, but other than that, why, uh, just so what you had to do. I saw the destruction before I saw the, the dead. It's, it's almost a num numbing experience. You don't know what to do. It was, it was something else. We must have killed a hundred and 40,000 Japanese on Okinawa. It was terrible. One of the bombers went down, mm -hmm. the B-10s, went down, and it went down in about 25 to 30 feet of water, and the whole crew was trapped in there. But we couldn't rescue them because they couldn't get out. We couldn't get to them. And that, that's something that I think of many times. But ordinarily, if they were in a little further to shore, or they could have gotten out of that plane somehow, or we could have gotten down there to, 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 to get, to break the glass or whatever, but we, we couldn't, we couldn't rescue these 10 people. And that's, that, that. that bothered me. And um, so all, of, all the while some of this stuff was going on, you have to realize that we're not only being shelled, but the kamikazes, especially at Okinawa, they were, they just drove you wild night and day these suicide pilots, you know. And uh, many times I thought uh, that if they ever hit us, uh, I wouldn't get home. The one thing you wanted to learn is when a plane came down on the sort of water level, you had a ceasefire because your shells would ricochet off and hit probably your own people. We had that happen at Okinawa the one plane, we got, we hit five of them, and the sixth plane got right down, and he flew right by me, I could see him. And he was heading right towards where we were a half hour before, the other ship was in the base, and he hit that right at the engine room. But in the meantime, we seized fire, some of the other guys kept shooting, and they injured and killed 51 of our own people on the other ship from the, our own shells. See, you make mistakes like that, and that's where you have to make the right decision. 
When we got on shore, General MacArthur was with one of his aides, and there was a samurai sword sticking out of the ground. And he asked the general if the general would like that sword, and he said, leave it alone. And they left it. Later on, they found out that it was a booby trap. Oh. And, and that, that, that kind of raised the hair on the back of my head. We're getting so many patients a day that uh, we finally put on two, two surgical gloves on each hand in the morning and then just took the top one off. How many patients were you seeing every day, approximately? Once the Normandy invasion started, uh, 500. We worked around the clock during the invasion. It, uh, after 72 hours of no sleep, uh, I remember one, one orthopedic uh, surgeon did 77 cases before he got out of, away from the table. Matter of fact, I went back to Luxembourg to have my eyes examined. I didn't just go, I got permission to go. And there I met, since I wasn't otherwise wounded, the most remarkable people. If you all remember these, these, these nurses were golden girls to be available for anything. Just tremendous people, and I can't say enough for them. I don't know if any of you have heard of Axis Sally. She was a, a news, a, a reporter that had turned traitor to the United States, and she was on the Italian radio, and she would it was just a, a regular uh, FM radio program. And she would play music, and so that was the only way we had of getting any music was tuning in her. And she would say, today the 17th Bomb Group will be coming into Italy, and uh, we'll be waiting for you, and they were. I would say the average temperature was 14 or 15 degrees, day and night. When you got through the night, you had to go through the day in the same way. In those years, it was, in those times, the ground was frozen so we couldn't dig in against incoming artillery. But we could dig in with snow drifts and get out of the wind, which we did. I was flying co-pilot and uh, the uh, engineer would hang in the doorway leading to the uh, radio room. And he, uh, this day, uh, all of a sudden, he was st standing there and he says, I'm hit, I'm hit, I'm hit. And he's got red fluids in his hand. Well, a piece of anti-aircraft had come in through the cockpit and cut a uh, hydraulic line, which the hydraulic fluid was colored red. And so he assumed that he had been shot. Well, he wasn't. And on uh, August 6th, there was a rumor that they dropped a bomb. And we've heard all those things before. So we went out drinking beer. And uh, next day it persisted. Finally, on the third day, we were told that they had dropped a bomb on Hiroshima. Didn't know about Nagasaki. And of course, we couldn't believe it. First, it sort of scared me to think that we had something that destructive, uh, but after I got thinking about it, uh, I realized that uh, that put a short, shorted the war by a lot, by several months or years, and it, then it didn't bother me as much, but it did at first. We were getting ready for the invasion of Japan, and the, the atomic bomb was dropped about four days before we were supposed to go for to the beach at a, a place called Batangas for training. And so that, of course, was called off. And ten, ten days later, we were on the way to uh, Tokyo. And uh, we were sitting on a battle on a, on a ship about half a mile from the battleship Missouri when they signed it and surrender. When the war was over, 
then there was a, a policy that said you couldn't fraternize with the Germans because they were the enemy at the time. Even after the war we were given, but that was something that wasn't very, uh, we didn't abide by it too much. We got to talking to the Germans. We had them do things for us. They did our laundry, they did our cooking. Even meeting the enemy was no challenge. We took prisoners on the one island and the Japanese, they had a box they were carrying and I says, what's in the box? He said it was his buddy he had cremated was taking him home. So that taught me a, a respect for people, you know. I thought he's an enemy, but he's got respect because he was doing what his leaders told him to do, the same as we were told. Japanese people were very respectful. They, if, uh, if they were riding a bike, they would get off their bike and walk past you. And if it was an ex-soldier or ex-sailor or whatever, he would bow and salute as you went by. Germany was just a lot of rubbish, more or less. If you would go into a city, You'd see some walls that were just standing and nothing was left of it. So when, after the war was over, then we started rebuilding and furnishing the people with food and clothing again. We came home in three days and 17 hours. Wonderful. And when I later saw that ship, all of the handrails were covered with that old American habit of carving your initials into something. Did you do that? No. I was an officer. <laughs> and when I saw it in later years, all those had been reserved with glass coverings over them. They are today the same way. I, I, I was discharged on the 14th of March. 14th of April, I got engaged to my and then on the uh, 14th of September, we were married. So in that six month period of time, I had a pretty nice time. You could hardly move at, at um, Times Square. It was that crowded. You see pictures of it uh, during the, uh, some celebrations. Well, it was like that. You just couldn't, you couldn't move around. It was, uh, you got shoved and pushed. And <laughs> Finally, I got out of there and went back to Jackson Heights where I belong. <laughs> One of the biggest lessons I probably took away from the Air Force um, was um, the idea of leadership um, and what it took to be a leader um, and what it meant to be it. But the other thing um, was about the ideas of integrity, um, commitment, um, selflessness, um, those types of things. Um, were huge um, and ingrained as part of um, what we did as a member of the military and that whole idea of service before self um, and what it took um, to do the job. What would you consider to be the mo your most important contribution to the service or while you're in service? Probably the fact that when I went in some veteran was able to go home. Uh, I think just being Part of that group of, of trying to save people and, and, and stop their suffering, you know. It wasn't easy because there was a lot of uh, blood loss. There was a lot of, you know, it's, when you're 18 and, and you say, you're trying to save somebody, you know, it could pass away, and he did. So that was a little very difficult. It was the third most important thing that happened to me in my life. My wife was my first, and the, ch the kids were two, and World War II was the big one. It's indescribable. Why we're sitting here today is to, to know and let you younger folks know what happened, that uh, to keep this thing moving about the sacrifices so that so many veterans 
made in their lives that changed them and um, hopefully made them better. You know, there's a lot of people that are still devastated with post-traumatic stress syndrome, their, their wounds and so forth, and they got a lot of healing to do. So um, I think it's important that the veterans talk about what, what they did. I don't care what it was, you know, you didn't have to go overseas necessarily to, to be part of that. I think it was important that the kids that didn't get drafted, that were on farms and in factories and that, that was all contributing to the success of winning the war. So I think all those things are very important.